the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus told the disciples a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice, so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise you, Lord Christ. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Well, it seems that about once a year or so, either the Gallup poll people or the Barna Group people will release a survey about Americans' relationship with the Bible. The results of these studies are never very encouraging. A recent Barna Group survey found that only about 15% of adults in the United States read the Bible daily, while nearly half of the adults in the United States don't read the Bible ever. And pretty much every survey also shows that biblical literacy is declining at an alarming rate. Sometimes, even an informal poll demonstrates the problem. A few years ago, when Jay Leno was hosting one of his television shows, he wandered out through the audience asking some questions. Could anyone name any of the Ten Commandments? Well, one of the answers he got was, God helps those who help themselves. <laughs> Could anyone name one of the apostles? Actually, nobody in his audience could name even one of the apostles. At least nobody would admit to it. On the other hand, when you asked if anyone could name the Beatles, the audience quickly came up with all four of the bad four. I'm sure we could do better than that here at Emmanuel. Are you feeling nervous yet? <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with a simple question. What's the shortest verse in the Bible? Jesus, Jesus wept. I won't ask you where, where that's found, but it's, it's drawn up from the Bible. But of course, you know, that doesn't always really work because some modern translations say something like, Jesus began to weep, which doubles the word count in that verse. But here's a question that different translations won't affect. What's the longest chapter in the Bible? Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Atta boy. <laughs> Psalm 176 verses long. It is not really the psalm that you want to try to memorize for a Bible <laughs> trivia contest. But of course it really is Bible trivia, isn't it? And, and knowing such things as the, the longest chapter in the Bible would have held you in good stead in Sunday school when you were a child, but it doesn't prove much about how well you know the Bible. I want to think with you today about the Bible, the Holy Scriptures, and, and why the Bible is important for us to hear, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest, as our prayer that I shared with you at the beginning of this sermon says. 
The second lesson today from 2 Timothy gives one answer when it says that the sacred writings are able to instruct you for salvation through Jesus Christ. And, and then Paul goes on to say that the scriptures are inspired by God and useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Oh, there's a lot of sermon material in those few words. But rather than looking at 2 Timothy primarily, what I'd rather do is reflect on the one little segment of that very long Psalm 119, which was our psalm for this morning, and how it entices us to want to hear and read and study the Word of God. And maybe you'd like to have the words of the psalm open before you as we walk through it together. It's on page three of your service book. Page three of page. The psalm is really a song in praise of the law of God. And that's a bit of a tricky concept for Christians because much of the Old Testament law has to be always read through the lens of Christ if we can make any sense of it. But for our purposes, let's just say that when the psalmist talks about the law, or about God's commandments, or about God's word, we can understand him to usually be talking about the Holy Scriptures, the Bible. Now I want you to take just a quick look at these verses, and let me point out something very interesting that you might easily have overlooked. Every single verse in this passage contains some combination of the pronouns I or me and you or your. That is to say, every single verse has something to do with the relationship between me and God. God is the you in each of these verses, or the your, and I or me, that's me. So every verse in this, in this section of the psalm has something to do with relationship between me and God. Indeed, if you looked at the whole psalm, almost every one of the 176 verses contains those two pronouns. The psalm seems to be on the surface about the law, and it is to some extent, but it's really more about relationship. It's about the relationship between God and me how that relationship is shaped and formed by the scriptures. So verse 97, first verse of our section, begins, Oh, how I love your law, all the day long it is in my mind. You know, I really enjoy hearing married couples talk about how they got together. Every story is unique. In the case of Lois and me, a, a letter played a key role. I don't have time to tell you the whole story in detail, but let me give you the postcard version. We had been acquainted with one another because her brother was my best friend, and she and I were both participants in her brother's wedding, although we hadn't seen each other in three or four years. And at the time of this wedding, she had just graduated from college, and she was engaged to another guy, though not entirely happily. There was a kind of spark between us at the wedding, at least that's what I'm told. I was sort of curious to it. And a few weeks later, I got a letter from her. It was a newsy letter telling me where she was living and what she was doing. And then at the end, a P.S. By the way, she said, I'm not engaged anymore. <laughs> so sad. Maybe you have a similar bundle of letters. 
And you know how in those olden days before texting and email, letters were often such a crucial and wonderful part of a romance, so much so that we even have a phrase that we use to describe them. They're, they're love letters, right? And maybe you remember how when one of those love letters arrived in the mail, you read it, and then you read it again, and then you read it again, and then you read it again until certain words and phrases were so indelibly etched into your mind that you carried them with you all day long. You loved those words. But what you really loved was the one who wrote them to you. And that's what the psalmist is talking about. The Bible is like a love letter from God. Oh, how I love your law, the psalmist writes, but of course what he really means is, Oh, how I love you, my God. The reformer John Calvin has a reputation of being a pretty dour and sober guy, a legalist of the first order, but when he writes about this psalm, he says that the psalmist was inflamed with incredible love of God. So much so, he says that he was continually meditating on it, like a love letter. It is, Calvin says, an ardent love that ravishes our hearts, like a love letter. The next three verses of the psalm really belong together. Your commandment has made me wiser than my enemies. It is always with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your decrees are my study. I am wiser than the elders, because I observe your commandments. These verses speak of wisdom and study and understanding, and certainly that's an important part of why we read the Bible. Second Timothy makes the same point. The scripture's purpose is to teach us, to help us grow in knowledge. But it's not really head knowledge, is it? We don't read the Bible primarily because we want to find out the order of the kings of Israel and Judah or the dimensions of Solomon's temple. No. The knowledge that we seek from God is relational knowledge. Think again of the love letter analogy. Probably that bundle of love letters in your garage has a lot more than just page after page of ardent affection. The letters speak of hopes, of dreams, maybe of fears. They speak of trivial things as well, what your lover had for dinner, what movie they saw. But they're all about learning to know another person. Last year I was doing some genealogical research and in a collection of stuff in a library back in Indiana, this is kind of bizarre, but you need to know the details, in this library I found a letter written in 1924 by my great-grandmother to her cousin telling about the last illness and death of her husband, my great-grandfather. She wrote simply but eloquently about her feelings during his illness and death and the loneliness that she now felt more than a year later. I never met my great-grandmother. She died years before I was born. But in reading this 95-year-old letter, I began to know her. Because words can be found. Words are how we come to know someone, to really know them. Way back when I was, I think, 23 or so, I was attending a conference or a meeting of some kind. I think it was in St. Louis, although the details have long ago vanished from my mind. But I know, whatever it was, I was on a college campus. And that night, there happened to be a Christian band playing. And it was a kind of music that I'd never really heard before. And it wasn't really my cup of tea then, or now, for that matter. But they sang a song called Fool's Wisdom, written by a British gospel beat duo called Malcolm and Alwyn. I 
can't even remember the melody with any accuracy, but I've never forgotten the opening words. Got myself some wisdom from a leather-backed book. Got myself a savior when I took a second look. Opened up the pages, and what did I find? A black and white portrait of a king who's a friend of mine. We read the Bible thinking to find wisdom, and what we really find is a friend. We read the Bible to try to learn something about Christ, but what we really learn is to know Christ, to know Him in the same way that we can learn to know a friend or a lover just by reading a letter. The next two verses also belong together. I restrain my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. I do not shrink from your judgment because you yourself have taught me. Learning to know Christ is learning to walk in His way, and it's learning to live as He would have us live, and sometimes this is difficult and it brings us up short. Jumping back to 2 Timothy for a moment, Paul says that Scripture is useful for reproof and for rebuke. Reproof, of course, means somebody telling you what you've done wrong. Anybody here like that? I know I don't. And yet we all need it. Because we all sin, we all mess up. Somebody at our men's breakfast and Bible study said on Thursday, we're all idiots. <laughs> it's really great when we read a passage that offers comfort and peace. But sometimes we read a passage that offers reproof. And judgment. It tells us quite honestly how far we have fallen short of God's will for us, and it tells us quite specifically in what ways we have fallen short. Did you experience that this morning listening to Gary read the gospel lesson where Jesus tells the disciples about their need to pray always and not lose heart? I took that as reproof because I know that my prayers are more often better described as sporadic than always. And I know too that I have often give, given up and lost heart when I think that my prayers aren't being answered. So yeah, I took it as reproof, but very honest and necessary reproof. But you know, that's how we grow, isn't it? We grow the most when we recognize that we are not all that we should be or all that we can be, and we usually recognize that best when it's pointed out to us. And that's what the Bible does for us. It reproves us, Paul says to Timothy, but it also corrects us and trains us. <coughs> and the psalmist follows up the talk of reproof with this, how sweet are your words to my taste, they are sweeter than honey to my mouth. A couple of things to notice here. When we read the Bible with faithful hearts, the words are sweet. Even the words of reproof are sweet because we know that they come out of God's love for us. But the analogy here is to eating sweeter than honey to my mouth. God's word is not like an inoculation. It's not like a flu shot I got the other day where you just inject something into you and then it does its work without any further thought on our part. No. It's more like eating. And you know, you can just wolf down your meal. A lot of people do that. You can kind of inhale it and you'll get the nutritional value maybe, but Where's the joy? The joy in eating is in tasting and chewing and savoring. And that's how it is with God's Word. At the beginning of this sermon, I pray 
one of our wonderful Book of Common Prayer colleagues, which asks God's help as we read the scriptures to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them. Oh, I always love that last phrase, inwardly digest them. The Christian Bible is like food. It's, it's necessary for life, to be sure, but it's also the occasion for so much joy and pleasure. Sweeter than honey. And then the last verse in our passage. Through your commandments I gain understanding, therefore I hate every lying way. What we seek in the Bible is truth. There is so much in our world that tells us lies. You're not good enough. You don't have enough to be able to afford to be generous. You're not of any value. Lies. All of them. Lies. When we learn to know Christ, when we read and take to heart the word of God, we begin to gain understanding. We begin to know the one thing needful that he loves us, that he forgives us, that he welcomes us, he embraces us, he laughs with us and weeps with us and walks with us, he gives himself to us and invites us to give ourselves to him. He sends us this love letter. He softly whispers, you will be my people. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.